All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an awesome time so far. Our next panel is called Future Proof Design, Designing Buildings for Flexible Uses. Please join me as we welcome our panelists to the virtual stage. And Sarah, I'll hand it over to you to kick things off. Hi everyone, we've got a great set of voices to talk about this topic of future-proof design today. Um, we're going to spend the first couple of seconds here introducing ourselves and then we'll jump right into the conversation. So let's start with Corey. Hi Sarah, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Corey Brueger. I'm a principal and chief technology officer at HKS and I'm responsible for leading the teams dedicated to the implementation of new technologies, new processes for design construction. And, uh, and really delivery projects. Awesome, how about we hop over to Kelly? Hi, I'm Kelly Farrell. I am a commercial and corporate market director at MBBJ. And my passion in the practice really relies around how we can create great environments for people. Awesome, Jim? Hi, I'm Jim Viviano. I'm the uh, managing principal for AECOM Building and Places in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my specialty is corporate commercial work, uh, specifically uh, mixed use projects. Thank you. Awesome. And I'm Sarah Causey, the Director of Design Technology at Ratio. Um, and I'm looking forward to having this wonderful conversation. Uh, we, we seem like we're all in the same headspace of integrating technology to deliver just the best uh, buildings and spaces for our users in the world. So. Let's dive right in. Uh, just so everyone knows, we have not talked before, so this is gonna be a very real and candid conversation. Uh, let's talk high level first. What role will technology play in design buildings of the future? And feel free to talk about any trends you're seeing that, uh, that may be guiding that vision for you. And anyone can hop in. Okay, I'll jump in um, and feel free, feel free to free fluid tail on. But maybe, maybe the way to start this um, rather than trend is really to talk about the last year. You know, all so many of the longstanding norms that we've adopted, how we live, how we work, how we study, how we play, they've got holes all over them. Mm -hmm. And we've also seen tech adoption of this incredible. Um, exponential rate. You know, if you're in our conversation today, likely Team Zoom or some other digital collaboration platform is in your life in a disproportionate scale and really in new places. I think that um, for me, what's interesting is they've entered my doctor's office, my gym. They aren't generationally constrained anymore. And it's not the workforce going first, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. So I know we can pass a verdict on it, but I think it's a lot more than just communication. It's about how we're engaging with goods and services through the physical environment. You know, our laptops, my phone, um, I've got one of these on and if anybody else does, but they're generating and collecting all of this data and we have a real opportunity to take that information and create a seamless experience with it um, through so many different facets than we've ever had before, whether it's health, whether it's how we work, whether it's how we engage in community. So I think this um, kind of era of consumer information, um, technology is paving the way for it. Yeah, I'll just add that, um, you know, to your point, um, you know, we really were forced into it. And, uh, you know, it's like, like I have a, I have a 20 year old daughter and, you know, she grew up with uh, technology, right? Um, but uh, I'm a little bit older than she is. And, you know, and I know that there are people older than me that have really kind of were forced to learn how to get on a Zoom call or, or a Teams meeting call that had never done that before uh, or use their phone in a way that uh, they were never you know, asked to use a phone anymore to connect to the internet or like you say, to their doctor's office or whatever. So, so technology and data has, has really been forced upon us um, the past year, year and a half. And I think, you know, that's probably the positive that's gonna come out of, out of this pandemic is that everyone is gonna be much more uh, capable from, uh, from, from a technology standpoint uh, than probably where we were 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Internally, we, we refer to the, this idea of 
everybody, every person, every building, every city having a footprint as well as a cloud print. As we start moving into the, the, the integrated systems, the, the data collection, the opportunity to really leverage not only what people are doing in the space, how they're doing it in the space, and what the exhaust, what digital exhaust is coming out of those interactions with the building, with the environment, with the technology. This really just opens up a, a whole new paradigm of opportunity for us. What are the use cases that are changing for our buildings, for our cities? How do we actually create better benefits, more well-being, and real new opportunities for uh, for inhabitants and, and and for the people that we're designing for? Um, I do think that, that that adoption rate, the the acceptance that things will change and technology enables us to rethink how we work is um, is kind of fundamental and it's a great shift for the industry and, and where we've been. Do you know, you made me think of something, Corey. Um, sometimes our industry, the AEC industry has been criticized for being behind a lot of other industries from a disruption place. Do we feel like this year has kind of disrupted for us and pushed us in that direction? I, I, um, uh, I'm trying to be polite. I, I do think <laughs> it has influenced the way that we are looking at technologies. I, I don't mm -hmm. think the technologies or a lot of the systems we've adopted have fundamentally changed what we do as a profession. Um, I think that's where we haven't hit the mark, that, that we've just adopted or adapted our processes to the new environment, to the technologies, rather than rethinking the processes that need to be redefined, the, the inefficiencies, the ineffectiveness that does exist in, in the practice today, there's opportunities for us to really leverage technology that we think them, whether that's supply chain, whether that's design, whether it's regulatory review, all of those areas have opportunity where we can leverage technology to improve the process, to gain more benefit or to prove more value to clients and to the, the occupants of the cities and buildings we design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll build on that. I think we're at this um, deceptive point with where we're, where we're, um, where we see technology disrupting AEC, because we're seeing the supply chain develop, that it's starting to digitize, and it's going to be a different conversation for how we deliver and construct in the next few decades. We're seeing the data sets that we have become much more mature, much faster. And frankly, we can collect them faster than we ever have before. You know, my, um, my nephew could put out a survey tomorrow and collect data if he wanted to. Now, if it's good data, that's a different question, but you can get to it faster. So I think where we're going to see the big push is, um, well, maybe I'll put it in the context of last year as well. We're going to see a big push because I think that disruption we're going to be able to solve better problems. You know, resilience, I know we've got sustainability somewhere in our discussion today, and I'll happily raise it to resilience early, because as we broadly look at that, health, economic, equity, environmental, those four kind of keystones, the health crisis we've had, the equity crisis that we've had in the last year has reminded us how delicate that balance can be. And, you know, if you, if you look at it, um, in the first eight months of the pandemic, we wiped out the economic progress from 2008 to 2020. Like we wiped it out. And so we've got to put, and we've got to disrupt this industry and the progress we can make um, on fast forward to be able to capture all four of those keystones so that we can keep some balance in what we're building and we've got a good foundation. So. I think it's coming. I just think we're in the sneaky little phase where everyone doesn't see it yet. And mm -hmm. it's going to take off with the challenges that we're gonna start solving. Jim, did you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I, I, would, I just wanted to add and say, you know, that the thing that has happened um, over the past year has really been a, uh, uh, you know, kind of this renaissance of communication, right? Of, of finding better ways to, to, to communicate um, 
which had to replace the face-to-face -face communications. And so I think what, you know, if, if technology, if the A and C uh, or A and E uh, technology has to, has to kind of grow up, I would say that what we have learned this past year in communication, that's probably where the technology of how we communicate our industry, how we communicate with one another, how we communicate with, with contractors, the construction industry, our clients, I think that's where we're going to see some real growth and some real potential now with the tools that we're already using, BIM and, 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 and all of the things, all of those tools that we use. But now how does that now become communicated faster, better, more efficiently than the way we're using it now? You know, we're still, let's face it, a lot of us are still drawing or we're, we're, we're doing things in BIM, but we're printing it out on paper to communicate it or, or a PDF to, to, the, to the building industry. And I think that that's probably the area where, you know, communi communication really needs to grow in advance is do we really need to do that? Can we somehow communicate the 3D model directly to the building industry? And, uh, and, and, and I think that's an exciting, you know, it's an exciting time for us. Yeah, agreed so much. Um, I know that this is not necessarily in the same line we talked about, but since we're focusing so much on data in a couple of these comments, let's go there for a little bit, um, a little bit further. So, you know, we know that there's a lot of data. Kelly's been talking about it, Corey's been talking about it. But for me personally, and I want to tell you, this is going to age me and judge me if you will, but I am a millennial. Here I am. <laughs> Uh, when the inter I like to think about, about data and design as compared to the internet. So uh, when my generation came about, we put a bunch of stuff out there. There's a lot of stuff. And uh, it's really difficult now, and bless their hearts, it's on the next generation to filter through all that stuff and decide what's true and what's, what's authentic, what's worthwhile, especially in this age of fake news and misinformation. So how does our industry and, and those of us working on design use data or more importantly, are there strategies to filter through all that data to really get to a better end product, a better building or a better space? I'm gonna pick on Kelly. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna game up the question. So cool. yes, I agree with you. There's a lot of stuff out there. Um, and then you look at the world and AC is getting smarter, mm -hmm. but every other single industry around us is getting smarter. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of, for me, how we prioritize, because that's, that's the issue. Like, you know, you can be a mile wide and a mile deep, but it doesn't matter if you don't have a priority in it. Um, our practice partners with WashU and Dr. John Medina, because we're super interested in the molecular biology science of how space affects people. Cool. And so we wanna take that data and test it and try it on for size um, because we wanna be able to approach the problems we're looking at in a much smarter way. So first I think it's on your generation too, it's on my generation, I'm not that far in front of you, so don't worry, okay. uh, the white hair is misleading, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it's on all of us to help get the priority set around that data correct mm -hmm. for the outcomes, because the data has got to serve the people, not yeah. the other way around. And why we've been building it, you know, there's all sorts of conversations about what your data is used for. Opposite, it's human plus data, not data in lieu of human. Mm. And it should benefit, if we go back to that resilience conversation and go, it should benefit that greater resilience factor. So how is the information that we're using making a better environment for people? How is it making the environment better? How is it building a better business case so that we've got good economic balance in the world? How are we using it to really understand the impacts on communities and equity so that we're, we're building design that puts justice first not somewhere mm -hmm. in the equation, I hope it works out. So yes, and we've got to prioritize it and we've got to make it smarter through our use. And frankly, a lot of that's through good partnering. So we've got to go get the other people who are top of their field that can help inform what we're doing. 
Do you, can you give us an illustrative example of this? I, and if it's okay, if not. Yeah. <laughs> Um, where, where do you want me to go on, on the microbiology? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of science around how you behave in a space and how you behave with other people and how your body responds to it. Um, it's not new science. It's been developed for a long, long time. We as architects were really focused on the technology around how we build things, mm -hmm. tectonics, figuring out how to do more with less. Um, but there are these people who occupy everything that we do. Right. And it's high time we put them in the center of the circle. So we're designing spaces and looking at the plant life and saying, okay, what does that plant life do to lower cortisol levels, which reduce stress for you, which help you heal faster, in addition to how much do you enjoy it? Right, so it's taking all of that information. I wildly couldn't have told you what any of those things were without going out to expertise in the field, right? So we need to keep stretching those muscles, if you will, and extending over because the experts that we have in those places, they can help us drive such a better solution than going about it and testing it by ourselves. They just can. I love it. Yeah, Thank you I, for sharing that. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I was going to say um, at AECOM, we've got a whole division called Strategy Plus. And they, although there are some designers that make up that group, they are, you know, they're people uh, with other degrees and other interests and other expertise. And it is about uh, collecting, gathering the data, but it's really about processing and understanding that data to create um, both a two dimensional. Uh, idea about help, how to help businesses and universities and, and others on um, how to grow, how to grow smartly. But then it's really translated into the three-dimensional world. Um, and so as an example, it would be like a college that would come to us and want us to look at, you know, their growth plan for the next 10 or 20 years and, and you know, how they're going to house their students, uh, the teaching facilities that they're going to need, we analyze all of that and then produce kind of a three-dimensional version of what it would look like and where they should take that. Uh, and, and we can prove it. We can show through analyzing this data, you know, what the benefits are for the university. And, or, and I'm using a university as an example, but it could be a corporation. It could be a big company, you know, a, a, a Home Depot or a Microsoft or somebody like that. So um, it, it, it really is about gathering the data, but it, but after that, it's really understanding it and, uh, and processing it in a way that is really, you know, as Kelly said, I mean, it's compatible with humans, right? We, we, that, that's, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a better world and make a better space and a, and a work, a working environment, learning environment, healing environment for people. So I'll just leave it at that. Awesome. Yeah, I, I'd love to weigh in on this because I, I do think this is one of those great opportunities where we can leverage what's happening in the world around data collection, around the digital exhaust coming up and the systems we use and get into an idea where we're really focusing on how do we ask the right questions of the information? And then what are the outcomes that we're really focusing on? And we're doing a ton of work as well in research around brain health, well-being. Uh, and when you start looking at that in terms of healthcare facilities or educational facilities, what is the impact of access to sunlight, you know, low frequency gamma rays and getting into vitamin D? How does that impact circadian rhythm? Um, there's a ton of research and partnerships. Again, we've done work with Salk Institute, with the Brain Institute to help get the right information about how biology responds to the, the environments that we create. The other aspect of it is there is opportunity for us to leverage and move towards how do we take that same process, the diagnostics and the systems and put them in place to ensure that our buildings are performing the way that they should be? So when we're starting to look at sustain, sustainability and resiliency, when we look at carbon, uh, net, uh, net zero or net zero carbon, how do we actually start to get to a point where what we designed is really living up to those expectations? And that gets into this idea of being able to track 
and, and optimize the building, not during the design process, but after occupancy, during the life of the building, the, 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 the management and operations side is, is a much longer time frame and, and a time frame where the inefficiencies come out. So just like the body, being able to diagnose, being able to engage and being able to continually improve upon what it is to be most efficient and extend the life of either the, the occupant or the building itself is really kind of this incredible opportunity we have. You know, Corey, just to, just to build on that, um, I took my car in for maintenance last week, which may sound odd during the pandemic, but it actually needed it. And we have largely designed buildings that we as designers and take our, our friends in engineering to um, put into the world and everyone says, thank you. And there's an operations team that comes in and about every eh, 10 to 20 years, it's time to upgrade. It's time to shift things. And I think we've all been in that situation where you go back in, you say, wow, what happened? And, you know, part of, part of how we see the future is there's a lot more engagement back mm -hmm. to say what's working? How do we make it work better? How do we twist the needle, twist the knobs so that we can get to the outcomes we wanted and we can get to the outcomes we modeled and designed for? And I think the intelligence in what we're building, and Sarah, you're, you're kind of opener with them. We've got smarter digital twins that we can test and try and connect to and say, all right, if we're not getting outcome A, let's, let's try this and let's see what happens. And we've got the ability to do that today. And that gives us a huge opportunity with the built environment going forward. It really, really does. It also allows us to test things that haven't happened yet um, and see what will happen with those buildings. You know, we've got, we've got so much existing building stock, so much aged existing building stock that there's a real opportunity to come back into that and say, all right, let's really look at your property. Let's really look at what you're investing in and what it's capable of and how we can augment it and take it new places. And yeah, it's the most sustainable way to, to go, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> for those who are listening and don't know what Kelly referenced, um, a digital twin is, is basically, you know, us as designers these days are modeling everything in three dimensions um, in order to deliver the drawings that the building's built off of. And that model, unfortunately, sometimes just goes on a hard drive and sits in a room, just like the original printed drawings did, um, which is a super big loss of an opportunity a digital twin is just a digital copy of the building. I actually personally dislike the term digital twin because that implies there's only one copy. I actually like to call them digital clones because you may have multiple. Ooh, I'm going to borrow that. I'm going to take that and take borrow it. it. So take it. Don't like mind attack it. of the clones or whatever. But no, there's there's multiple reasons you could use a digital twin for. But 100% other industries are grabbing onto that name as well. But the simulation capabilities, absolutely 100%. Or did you want to add something? I was just going to build on, on Kelly's comments. You know, the, the amount of not only existing stock that is out there today that requires renovation, update, um, the, the context that we're in right now, some of that stuff, we don't even know how it's going to be used, right? We, we may end up with overabundance of commercial space. We may end up with overabundance of utility spaces like car, uh, car, car garages. What do we start to do? How are we going to start to adapt those to a new reality that, that we're living in? And the, the opportunity for us is to leverage the context, leverage GIS data, leverage uh, economic, uh, the social uh, equity um, information to drive planning for how do we start to adapt the city to a changing reality in terms of the use case around different building typologies. You know, out here in California, if we do have an overabundance of, say, a hospitality space or commercial space, how do we how do we actually start to leverage that to take care of some real problems we have, like uh, affordable housing? Right there, there's just a, a a lot of opportunity to for us to rethink the economics and then the social equity and the benefit that built environment can have in our communities. Um, and and I definitely see that as this opportunity to look at what exists today, look at how it performs, 
look at how it is used and then simulate those new opportunities for new patterns of growth and new use cases for each of the buildings that are already existing. Yeah, perfect example of that is the uh, is the shopping mall, right? I mean, I know that you know everywhere you go, there's a mall that is in trouble or has closed down, or or, or some of the department stores are shut down. So, you know, to your point, I mean, uh, we do need to be careful about how we build because we have a history of overbuilding and then having to deal with the problems or 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 create solutions to the to the situations of overbuilding one type of building stock. And I, you know, I think there's tremendous opportunities with uh, with a lot of the malls and a lot of the buildings that uh, that retail once occupied, but trying to figure that out and um, and, and do it in a way that that is, uh, uh, you know, good for everybody is is the challenge. That's such a good transition, Jim, to we're talking about uh, hospitality, retail. Uh, what about, you know, multifamily, workplace, uh, mixed use? You know, how are we seeing uh, the use of space changed uh, with this new perspective coming out of this pandemic? Yeah, I, that was one of the questions uh, that I wanted to talk about a little bit about multifamily. So the trend in multifamily has been to get smaller and smaller units, right? Um, and, and what that has done is it's forced the growth of all of these storage buildings everywhere. And um, personally, I'm trying to figure out what is the lesser evil here? Is it, was it better to have bigger units with storage in the units um, for everyone? Or is it better to have a smaller unit and then build all of these, these massive storage facilities everywhere? Um, I'm on the fence, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious what the panel, uh, if you have an opinion, I think the, the, my personal opinion is that the more sustainable approach was to let everybody store their stuff in their unit uh, and in their apartment rather than to, than to build more buildings to store all their precious uh, goods. All right, who's got an answer for Jim? I definitely don't have an answer for um, the, the, you know, I, I do think that, that it ties into broader conversations that the way that, that our living spaces are going to adapt to ideas like flexible work, you know, if people do start having full remote schedules or some variation where you have part-time in office and part-time at home. Uh, most people, especially in urban environments, don't have space to, uh, to, to, to accommodate uh, a home. So how do we start adapting other existing spaces to accommodate these new use case needs? Um, you know, we, we've done a lot of work and then put out some proposals around what does, um, you know, not, not just storage space, but how do you turn some area of a building uh, or some area of a space, whether it be a studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, into a workspace that, that fits people's life, right? Uh, the, the hard part right now to work from home is, is actually quite, uh, let's say, a socially inequitable uh, situation. And not everybody has an environment that they can or are comfortable sharing with the world. And if that becomes a standard, or how we can or how we want people to work, then how do we how do we actually adopt new policies, new procedures, and build new environments that, that take out that, that inequity in the process? And that's a, that's a definitely a, a harder conversation, um, but it lends itself to also how do we rethink commercial space? You know, if it's no longer offices, if it's no longer individual workspace, we have to start proposing new ideas for how and why we go into the office. What mm -hmm. is, how is it that our clients are using that space to still maintain the event, to still gain customers, to still provide the services? If, if the, the idea is that their workforce doesn't want to or doesn't have to be in that space at all the time. And so there's, a, again, these are, these are opportunities for us to really rethink really how we how we divide our spaces and really how we leverage what we have today to meet the needs of, of really a, a changing not just demographic but a, a changing social concept concept of what work is. 
All right, so maybe I'll, I'll jump into this. So a um, few thoughts. Housing isn't shifting that dramatically in size. Like 1950, the average single family home was just about like 930 square feet, 940 square feet. We have a lot more stuff <laughs> than we've ever had before. Um, and you know, Corey, to your point, the conversation about, well, what do we do with all these assets? We need assets that are more agile, mm -hmm. like hands down across the board. Um, the old conversation is the race for the amenities war. Um, Sarah, how are we gonna attract your generation to come live in multifamily? We're gonna build out amazing amenities and you're gonna pay for them. And that was the model. Um, but we've got to build spaces and places that are smarter for different uses. Um, whether that's you're bringing healthcare into your home or into your office, whether it's you're working from home or you've adopted kind of a digital first lifestyle, right? How do I connect? How do I have choice? Um, let's not even get into all the packages that are showing up everywhere. Um, there's there are Amazon garages being you know, designed for multifamily buildings so they can handle all the packages and deal with theft. So the conversations about agility, I think largely um, from my perspective is how do you make it agile? How do you, you know, they're small things, right? Add the power, add the power console next to the lounge chairs by the pool. So if you wanna work from there for the day, you have power. It's not rocket science, but it's small science that can connect you back to nature while you're working, which gives you a better work from home experience than the rooms we're all in now. Um, the, can I put my office away at night? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the great things about going to work is leaving and shutting the door. And there is a physical act that takes place with the mental disconnect. And if, you, if you've read the reports during the pandemic, the Wall Street Journal put out this terrible, well, it was a great article, but terrible fact. We're all working more. Yep. We didn't take work from home and say, cool, I gained two hours and they go to the gym in my basement, or I'm gonna go walk around the block. We said, great, I'm gonna work for two more hours. Or you were potentially a parent who was struggling with a kid's Zoom class next to you. And you said, well, I didn't get enough done, so I'm gonna work three more hours. And then you get up and you have dinner and you push your laptop to the side. Well, mentally, your office never left. Mm -hmm. There was no physical act of putting it in a drawer or closing a cabinet or walking out the front door of the building and having it disconnect. So as we see more integration of all of these things coming together, we as designers have to be a lot more thoughtful about how we create act that the physical ritual that we need mentally to take place can happen because then I can put my office away and I can go enjoy my home life rather than seeing my laptop and my monitor and this camera I'm staring at you and going, oh yeah, I should really finish that. And my mind's over here, but my body's over here and neither one of them are in the same place at the right time. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity and especially as vaccines roll out, and as we get our social infrastructure back and we get kids back in school and we get care for aging parents back open and we get access to that infrastructure that we want, we need to look at the existing building stock we have and say, okay, how do we make it more agile? How do we make it more thoughtful? How do we align the ritual that the mind identifies with the act that we want to take place? Jim, how do you feel about those responses. Uh, well, I agree. I mean, I think that you know that this whole the whole twelve months that we've been living through is 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 going to change uh, a lot of things and aspects about the way we live and the way we work. I mean, I, I completely agree that you know the home is now, uh, and, and you can see it. I mean, people are renovating their homes like crazy right now um, in order to create space that is separate, that is a separate workspace from, from their living space. Um, I don't think that's gonna go away. I think that even you know, post pandemic, there's gonna be still a large majority of us that are gonna be working from home, if not full-time, at least part-time. Um, 
we've done a poll in our organization and the results are pretty clear that people are are kind of cool with working from home and the return back to the office is going to be slow uh, even if we were you know given the green light tomorrow i don't think that you would have a hundred percent of the people showing up to work the next day uh and, and we're okay with that we're fine with hey you know this is working uh, but we are also looking and evaluating all of our office spaces uh, across the country because you know it's going to change. There's going to be there's going to be a different atmosphere inside the office. Um, you know, people have asked me. They said, "Oh, you know, do you think that the return to everyone having their own office or their own cubicle is going to be the you know the, the the new future?" And I don't think so. I mean, I think that the open office concept concept is still is still going to be with us. But I think it's going to be because people still need to collaborate and they need to collaborate one on one in a room together or in a space together. Um, this is great, this virtual stuff, but it's not the same. There's still something lost in, in collaboration and people need that. We need, we're social animals. Um, we need to be together. We need to be together physically. We think better. We, we work better together. Um, so, I, you know, I think the, the office space, yes, it's going to change, but I don't think it's going to be this radical, you know, go back to closed doors and everybody had their own office. But at the same time, there's going to have to be some, some things that are implemented um, for safety and for, you know, uh, just people that, that are going to still feel a little uncomfortable, you know, being in, in very small spaces uh, you know, with one another. You know, we've um, we, we've spent this this past year. Um, we 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 do something called our living laboratories, and as we as we renovated some of our office spaces, or as we renovate each office space, we've added in uh, sensors to look at lighting, to look at uh, occupancy, to look at air quality, toxins, mm -hmm. um, and the goal of that is that we're experimenting with ourselves. We'll we'll shift around the way an office space works. Um, and during the pandemic, we've kind of doubled down on that strategy. We moved a couple of offices to completely virtual. We're renovating a couple of spaces to look at the opportunity for uh, shared collaboration space or engagement space, presentation space, um, and trying to figure out what is the right balance, right? Because at the end of the day, there does have to be some connection. There's an opportunity for us to rethink work-life balance and then what are the opportunities to improve well-being for staff and for their families? And with this, this process, we've been tracking a whole bunch of data on the backside, and that's everything from number of email sent, number of Teams messages sent, uh, both in terms of channels or direct messages, uh, getting into uh, how often people are inside of platforms like Reddit, Run, or our typical documentation platforms. And the thing that we have seen is that the work volume has increased slightly, I'd say maybe in the 10 to 15% range, but what has definitely happened is weekends have become work time for people. And I, that, that definitely goes to your, your, your comment, Kelly, that we don't separate from it. It's there and it's at the back of our mind. And how do you accommodate those schedules? You know, we're creating a, a flexible work policy that is really based on the communication aspect. How do we engage with staff to set the right cadence, the right parameters, and the right kind of bumpers for how our teams are going to work together long term? And it, it's not only about our teams, it's how are we engaging the clients in these opportunities? Because the one thing we have seen over the past year is that more people are willing to get on a Zoom call. So that gives us a frequency of connection to our clients, to our user groups, to really uh, push on our design solutions to make sure that they meet the needs of the client at, let's say, a, a more frequent interval than you know, your bi-weekly or your monthly meetings that, that you would typically be having. This gives us, you know, sometimes we're meeting with, with some of the clients, especially in early phases during programming, during visioning, you know, once or twice a week, um, and sometimes once or twice in a day, depending on who the client is and how engaged they want to be. And that's, that's an incredible place to be, to have this, this ability to connect and to really 
dive in together and collaborate on the best solutions. Um, but it does come at that cost of, of the not having that balance. And so I think, um, I think that that is going to be one of the hardest changes we make is how do we ensure um, and empower people to say no, right? Because I think that mm. that's lost in the, the pandemic is that ability to, to say and, um, and, and we have to say no to the right things. But I, I, I don't know, it's, a, it's an incredible, again, an incredible opportunity for us to rethink what our relationships should look like with our clients, with our teams, with the, the, the stakeholder groups and the user groups that, that we're designing. Well, I, yeah, I think to, to build on your, um, the user groups that we're designing for, what an opportunity from a development point of view to activate the spaces that drive collaboration and that drive mm -hmm. healthy gathering. You know, if we, if we look at the modern workspace, well, it's got some work. <laughs> it's got some work to do. Um, and I think every firm in the country, regardless of what you do, has been pulling their people to say, well, what is your expectation? What do you want, right? And the overwhelming statistics are the earlier in your career, the more you're looking forward to going back, the further advanced you are in your career, the more you're into hybrid. And it makes sense because you probably do a lot of your work isolated the later you are in your career, but you want to come together when it really, really matters and you're going to make something great out of it. And early in your career, you get all of that added benefit from the accidental conversation, the water cooler bump, the, did you hear this conversation? Like, where are we going? Because there's a lot of passive learning that takes place. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at where that future sits, I look at it and go, yeah, you wanna drive value around what is valuable. It's not like, you know, we've evolved from punch a time card and come into the office or come into wherever you're working. So we need to evolve the spaces around it to say, yeah, when we come to the office, yes, we're gonna need great air systems. And in 30 years, we'll have forgotten about this pandemic, right? Like we will be where we were a hundred years from the Spanish flu. Um, clearly our air systems weren't that great for what happened a hundred years ago, but we will get better and smarter and we will evolve past it. But if we can keep something, if we can really keep something, then it will be to, focus spaces that we build and that we create for where the highest value can come out of them. I want to go to the office to collaborate with people. If I've got to sit down and write a report or work on something where I just need to block everybody out, I can do that from home. But when I come in, I want that community and I want that community driving a better outcome for whatever, whatever the challenge is on the table. We've sort of been talking about this a little bit, because um, for me, when I say the word sustainability, I don't just mean green or low energy usage. I mean wellness and, and mental health. And Kelly, you referred to that earlier, and we've kind of been talking about those concepts. So um, yeah, it seems like we're all in the same headspace of, of thinking about the physical building as a place to collaborate, a place, a place for community. Uh, how can we uh, make sure that our designs in a, in a resilient or future-proof kind of idea is speaking to sustainability? We haven't gone super far into that, so let's let's head in that direction for a little while. We talked about some sensors. That was cool. What else we got? Sure. You know, I, I, I think the... One of the, the most important parts as we, we move to truly designing for sustainability or for resiliency is that the architects have to take, or all design professionals have to take more responsibility for the outcome of the building that we have. Um, Kelly said it earlier about, you know, we can't walk away from, from projects after they're done. I've, I've, I've presented this with uh, the cowboy uh, riding off into the sunset after saving the day. Um, which is a, it's a great image if, if you're, you know, grew up in an era where that, that was a, a, a part of your childhood. But it, it, the reality is that um, that's, that's not our responsibility. Uh, we, we do have to find ways to stay engaged long-term. And we're lucky enough that we have clients that we've 
spent decades working with them. Um, we've been we've been working on uh, a, a, our own uh, internal idea of what uh, post occupancy should look like because it's not just about does a building meet the con the, the the requirements of uh, what what systems were commissioned to perform to right the idea that that we call perfunc uh, functional performance evaluations does the building perform and do the occupants perform to the standards and to the outcomes or goals that were established during the design process. And the next part of our responsibility should be, and this is where we put a lot of effort is, how, if it doesn't meet those requirements, if it doesn't meet that criteria, why not? And how do we solve that with the client, for the client, that if we've said it's going to perform a, a particular way, then we should be focused on making sure that it does not just in the short term, you know, after the 11 month walkthrough and we say good, hands done, warranties are in place, but, you know, our commitment is to a client that a building is and should be performing to their expectation. And if it doesn't, then how can we, how can we figure out what root causes are causing it not to perform or, or the people aren't performing or aren't getting the benefits we thought they should? How do we rectify that so that it really does meet the, the needs of the people at a given time. And then I think the other aspect of that is you design, we, we have to design for flexibility because that chain, that, that use case, that typology uh, and the people will change over time. So how do we build systems in place to help measure what is happening in the building and then be able to leverage that information to design in a new context in the future? The great answer, yeah, I think go ahead, Jim. I was just going to say, I think, you know, sustainability, you know, everybody, I think, really wants to associate sustainability with energy savings and, and you know, and, and environmental issues. And, and I'm not taking anything away from that. But, you know, sustainability really, uh, for me, is about designing and building a building that is going to sustain time. So it's something that is going to be around a very, very long time because it was designed and it was built well, um, the technology that goes into it and the energy savings and all of those things are off, obviously you know, paramount. But if you design and build a building that is not going to function for what it was originally designed for, for um, a lengthy period of time and will eventually get torn down or you know, something will happen to it, um, then that's really not a sustainable building. And, and so sustainability, I think, starts with, you know, doing something for a community and for, um, and for the neighborhood and for the people that are going to use the building, not just today, but for generations to come. And I don't think that sometimes I don't think that is the first thought that, um, that you know, me or us as designers or our clients sometimes have when, when we start talking about sustainability. I think the first thought is, okay, a lead scorecard or, you know, water and energy savings and, and those types of things. And, and I think really the conversation should be more about what is going to make the building last over time and then figure out how do we incorporate the technologies that are going to also make it sustainable from an energy standpoint. All right, Kelly, we're almost out of time. So I'm going to give you one last chance. One last chance. Um, well, I'll, I'll just, I'll just throw out, um, I'll throw out this because I think it's kind of where um, a lot of the conversation has been going. Um, you know, our future where we're going, what we're capable of doing as a design profession in concert with our communities and our development partners, because we are one, one portion of the deal, right? Um, the practices, the development teams, the communities who pull science data and design together, they're gonna create the solutions that impact people first and the environment first. And they will have the ability to create the economic, the health, the environmental, the equity resilience that we're driving for. And so if we look at this moment in time, this is our opportunity to make that leap. Um, because in a way we've had a pause 
and we've had a bit of a reckoning. And so now it's time for all of us to step up and do that in a really, really smart way. Um, I, for one, am really excited. I think everybody else is pretty excited about what sits in front of us. Um, and, you know, I look forward to the world opening back up um, so we can get out there and make a lot of really brilliant things happen. What a great way to close. I want to thank all of you for your input today. And this is a great conversation. Um, I think there she is. Awesome. Thank you so much to all of our amazing panelists and a special thank you to Sarah for moderating. This has been a great time and I really enjoy hearing all of your insights. And I know the audience is giving you a huge virtual round of applause. All right, thank you so much. And so for the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. And along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and check out our awesome exhibits. Thanks so much and we'll see you around.